Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can to get through this. Um, and while what I am sharing is primarily aimed at my brothers, sisters, I want you to play close attention because in some ways it applies to you. And in other ways you need to have an understanding of this dynamic that is at play. I'm going to start by making a quick uh, analogy or uh, pass by, so to speak. Uh, you have probably seen me in many instances express uh, my disquietude and disapproval of the celebration and praise given to strong black women. And while I have explained it, I think that by sharing what I'm going to share today as it pertains primarily to men, but uh, to women as well, you can understand something. There's a reason why I am not a fan of celebrating it. It's not that I don't see it. It's not that I don't have an appreciation for it. It's that every time I hear strong black woman, it reminds me that there's a black woman doing something she wasn't designed and built to do. And definitely not to do alone. But it and and, and my problem is in celebrating it, it creates some sort of idea that that's what should be uh, strived for. That's what I'm looking for. I want to be a strong black woman and not realizing subconsciously that you will put yourself in a position where you will dismiss the help that is present for you. Men who are willing to step in won't be able to because there's a greater praise for the woman who's doing it by herself. Here's why that really bothers me because this is what I know for a fact as a black man and I consider myself to be a strong black man is that the strong in our culture are often left to fend for themselves. People don't come to the aid of the strong. People don't put down and come to check on the strong. The strong are often pushed and left aside, looking for a hug, looking for words of encouragement, looking for help with a solution because they're strong. What you'll find is there's a reason that so many times we hear about someone committing suicide and the first response is, I never saw that. I would have never known. Why? Because they were strong. They were strong. And, 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 and they suffered often in silence because all you saw was their strength. You didn't see their suffering. What I'm telling you, suffering is a part of the dynamic. You don't want to live in it, but you are going to go through a point where you are getting beaten to a pulp. And you want to be able to turn to somebody, but there's a problem. So this is to my brothers. And I'm going to use my life and... uh the life of David Mann. Uh, believe it or not, David Mann and I almost ended up doing something. Uh, one of my clients who uh, is a big time PR person uh, and a former exec at BET. Um, works with David, one of David's one of our clients and she felt it would be a good idea for us to get together because, th and this was during the time that David was uh, openly talking about his depression, uh, his two-year battle with depression. And it's something that David said that just shook me. And mine was similar, so similar to his. Just, just the way I explained it was a little different, just a little. He stood up and he said that because everyone saw him as the problem solver, because everyone saw him as the one that makes everybody feel better, because everyone saw him as the person who was uh, always upbeat 
and always and it seemed to be right. He said it was so much. It was so many days that he was just going to room and he would just sit there and cry. He would just sit there. He didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to talk. He and he was in there and he said it was he said what he felt like was that he was drowning. But nobody would ever know he was drowning until he drowned. And the way that I described it when I was talking to my therapist, the way I describe it, I said I feel like I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. I need help. I need love. I need a hug. I need something. I'm, 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 I'm about to break. I need help. And I'm screaming it at the top of my lungs and nobody's going to hear me until I can't scream any longer. And this came to me again because I was listening to a young black brother talk about what he uh, went through a few months ago and he described it as life was life in you know that Denzel thing says life was life in and I know what that's like last year I've had two times in my life where you can say life was lifing uh, well adulting was on a whole nother level and one was about 15 years ago or so, uh, when things start to go wrong with me, uh, when things start to go wrong with me, uh, in business and, and with my finances and, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, possibility and pro and eventually, uh, the probability of having to rebuild from scratch and looking around me and realizing that a lot of people that were around me were actually happy that things were crumbling around me. They were celebrating my demise. And I, as I sit there and I went through it, there was a point I thought I was going to break. There was a point where my only prayer to God was don't let me lose my mind. I promised God, I said, if you wake me up every day, I'll answer the bell. Don't let me die right now. I've got something to do. I've got something to prove to myself. I've got something to prove to the world. I've got something to prove to my children. Don't let me die like this and don't let me lose. My greatest fear was that the pressure and the hurt of what I was going through was so unbearable that I was going to break mentally. And I had worked with so many people that it had happened to because I was working with the homeless. I was working with clients and I was watching people who at one point were on the top of their game of doing fine. And all of a sudden pressure hit and something happened and they woke up one day and didn't realize or know who they were anymore. Or didn't have any idea of what they were supposed to do or where they were supposed to go. They had disconnected. If they were dealing with a certain level of dissociative disorder where they had disconnected from reality because they, 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 their consciousness couldn't deal with the pressure. And I was like, God, don't let that happen. Thankfully, I got through it and I went on. The next time that I had to deal with it was last year. Last year was unbelievable. Uh, a little over a year ago, my wife told me she needed her space. Uh, my love for her uh, told me to give it to her uh, without judgment. Uh, but it hurt. It hurt at a level that I still don't have words for. And and eventually that separation would lead to a divorce in October. Um, I would lose my younger brother to cancer in November. I would lose uh, an old track buddy in December to a blood clot. I would lose another friend a week later to a blood clot. Then turn around and just lost another friend. But 
2022 it pressed me and 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 what i needed was somebody i could turn to uh somebody that i could lean into somebody i could tell how i really felt and for the longest it didn't seem that the therapist you know yeah uh but i i, I needed someone who wasn't getting paid somebody that i felt i could lean into that 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 that, that was there and, I, and 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 the crazy thing is the person that i knew i could depend on was going through the exact same freaking thing it was almost simultaneous we got hit and i'm like you got to be kidding me and i'm not here whining about it now I don't, I don't i don't want to send that message i'm not here throwing stones there's no stones to be thrown uh, i'm talking about pain i'm not blaming anybody for my pain but i'm talking about it i'm saying that i went through some things that i couldn't get around that i couldn't skirt from that i didn't have an immediate resolution for there was no this is there are those things you're going to have to go through in life. There are some things that you solve, other things you endure. And you've got to understand that the problem is when you're strong. You can, I remember sitting up saying, man, I'm having a rough day. You know what I would get? You got it. You got it. Hold your head up. You got it. Because that's what people expect, especially when that's how you move consistently. Nobody ever expects that strong person to be at a point of breaking. And the person is looking for a hug. The person, man, when this dude's talking about this hug, man, I, 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 it's a metaphor, and then it's not. It's, it's this idea. But see, when, when, when black men are told early on that we don't, real men don't cry, real men don't feel. Real men don't express their emotions. Real men suck it up. And you go out into this world, and in order to really truly be who you be, you have to open up yourself. And the one thing is, and I don't regret one moment of loving my wife, is to love her. I had to become vulnerable to her. So I can be as tough as I want to in the world. I can sit up and take on the world. But in order to love a woman, you've got to leave yourself open. You've got to be vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, if it doesn't go the way that you're expecting, you're just going to have to take the hit. And while I di didn't act out, I didn't emote. I didn't lose my temper once. I didn't raise my voice once. I didn't go off whining and yelling and complaining to anybody, everybody would live. I was hurt. Then, while I'm trying to get my head wrapped around the idea that what I thought was forever is gone, my brother had hidden that his cancer had relapsed. And so by the, and I'm asking, I'm like, something's not right. And by the time I start really digging, because he wouldn't say anything, by the time I started digging and found out a, a week later, he was gone. He didn't want to bother anybody. He didn't want anybody to see him that way. And, and I, I respect it. I really do. I'm not angry with him because he didn't tell. He had to deal with that how he had to deal with that. And, I 100% I, I, I respect that. I don't tell people how to go through. And I love them, but it hit. Because he's, you know, I got some little brothers I love and look up to. My little brothers, man, uh, they're doing some things, and I'm proud of them. But this little brother, man, he was the one. He had the marriage thing down, the thing I was trying to get right. He had right. And I admired him for that, man. He was almost 30 years in the game when he left here. And he's my younger brother. And so that hurt. And then to hear about my buddy, you know, doing okay, man, just bam, gone. Then a week later, another friend, gone. And I'm trying to figure this out. And then what I had to actually end up doing is 
the first two weeks of this year, I had to take a mental health break. I had to literally just put it down. I was that close to breaking and nobody knew. I thank God for a couple of people, David Jones, who is a friend of mine, who happens to be uh, a psychologist. He uh, was very instrumental. Another brother by the name of Mark Davis, uh, my tech guy, uh, unbelievable, a little older than me, uh, wise, was my shoulder man. He from day one, he was he was he was there, and he let me be me because the one thing I didn't want was to go to people and they start taking sides. I, I didn't want that. Uh, so I was very careful about who I talked to in my family because I didn't want that. I, I didn't want to go to the average guy because the homeboys, the homies, they're not really friends. They're just homies. You know, they're going to get the, you know, screw this, F this, all this. And that's not what I want. There's this woman that I I held close to my heart. She wasn't there anymore, but I wasn't going to go after. And, and, and so I didn't want anybody around me talking like that. So I had to, and so Mark gave me room to be me. He said, you're different the way you're moving about this. And I applaud that in you and I respect that in you, but you've got to get some space to release. And so he talked me through this and Mark's not a therapist. Mark is just a good listener. Then I had my, my buddy, uh, Rod, who is an attorney and he was, that person that, you know, whenever I was really just feeling bad and, and fought, let's be honest, feeling sorry for myself, he would just say some off the wall stuff, you know, that was antagonistic. He was, he wasn't the, uh, oh, poor, poor Rick, man, you, you know, he would say something crazy and I would laugh and cuss him out. And then we would joke about it, and then I would feel better and the things like that. But what I'm telling you, if I didn't have that, it's easy to talk tough. And I've been through some things. Like I said, I grew up without my dad. I've gone through some things. I've lost some things. I've seen some pain. I've buried three siblings, all younger than me. I've been through some things, but last year hit, man. It hit hard. And, and I'm saying that because we've got to get to a place where we can give our brothers the space and the ability and the non-judgmental uh, engagement to say I'm hurting to say I feel broken, to say I feel weak, to say I need help. It's, it, 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 and it may sound like we're making excuses, but we wake up every day and answer the bell. We don't make excuses. But at some point in waking up every day and answering the bell, there has to be a release. And I'll tell you, my release was my marriage. I didn't dump a whole lot of stuff on my wife because my wife had a lot. And I knew this. There's so much that I didn't tell her because I didn't want to upset her because she was caring. So she was, it was just so much going on. But what that meant is I didn't have anywhere to turn and that was okay. But you know what I did? The responsibility that came with it was my release. The idea that I had something every day to wake up for drove me. It wouldn't let me give up. It wouldn't let me quit. It was, and then I, the problem became, I became so anchored in it that when it wasn't there, I was lost. Here's what you need to understand. And for sisters too, especially you ladies that are out there trying to do it by yourself. We weren't built to do it by ourselves. I don't care how much praise you get, how much celebration you get. I don't care how uh, educated you become. I don't care how many figures you got on your, ch your check. 
You weren't meant to do it alone. And then there's this cultural influence that has us in this space where we've convinced ourselves that we don't need each other. You know, there's a difference in being alone and being lonely. Yeah. And the thing is, you feeling yourself with all these trips, you feeling yourself with all these shopping, with all the shopping and all that, ladies, men, you're always with your boys, you're doing this, you're knocking down everything that moves, and you're not lonely. The thing is, you were meant to be. And the whole, and the whole thing is, if we're going to lose, use religion, we can use a biblical reference, and, and, and I can go and I can use so many other references, but I'm going to use biblical reference because most people do. Uh, when, 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 when we're talking about creation and it's a representation of a simple evolution of man, but we, we're talking to creation here. And, and God says that after reviewing his creation and looking, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. He didn't say he was lonely. He simply said it wasn't good for him to be alone. See, the idea is I have to be lonely and offer that order for there to be a need. No. The need is not in the loneliness. The loneliness is simply a representation of a feeling that's giving you an indication that something's missing. It says it's not good for him, man to be alone, so I shall make him a helpmeet, a companion. Some, and then it says, this thing will be so strong that a man will leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife and the two will become one. But we've gotten so to the point that we've convinced ourselves we don't need it and we are eating on the inside. There's a reason why the life expectancy is dropping, especially for black men, but for black women also. There's a reason why black women are the most likely to be depressed. And it ain't just because of black men. Sometimes it's because that there's no connectivity with black men. There is a spiritual connectivity that enhances and sinks and creates uh, 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 this unbelievable force. Masculine energy, feminine energy, two different functions. The male brain. It's unbelievable. Functions different. Operates from the front to the back. Focuses on what's accomplished. It's designed to go out and make things happen. Female brain functions from left to right. It's primarily focused on feeling, discernment, spiritual things. They're meant to sink. together and this isn't even about relationships but since I got on it that's got to be something we got to think about what I want to talk about is it's got to be a space for black men to admit we're hurting it has to be a space for black men to admit we need help we are so squeezed and we are in such a push and competitiveness to be accepted and praised and revered like other men are naturally. That we compete with one another when we should be creating brotherhoods. That we don't have the ability to say, I'm not on my A game today because we feel we're gonna be viewed as weak. God, for, God forbid we say help. Something that I've heard a long time, 
And I'm going to put this out there, and I really don't give a damn what anybody thinks about it, but it needs to be said because I'm so sick of hearing this shit. The idea that a couple can be together and somebody can tell the woman you don't need help because you got a man at home. Now, granted, your man is supposed to hold things down, but the idea that he's got all the answers all the time and he's never going to be in a situation where he needs help. Now, he should be the one seeking help, but no one should be telling you you don't need help because you got a man. They should be saying, where is your man? They should be saying, let me talk to your man. Let me tell you, I've done this on many occasions where women I knew who knew that I had the resources would come to me. And that's this conversation. I've done it so much that the conversation is like this. They come to me and say, hey, look, this is going on, uh, blah, blah, blah. Can you help? Can you help right now? First question, does he know you're here talking to me? If the answer is no, then you need to go back. Tell him you came to me. Then tell him to call me. And this is whether I know him or not. Sometimes I don't know the dude. Other times I do know the dude. But either way, tell him to call me. If he does know, and I know him, I'm calling him. Why are you sending her out to ask? But here's what I'm going to do. If it's something I can fix, I'm going to fix it. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk. We're going to figure it out. If it's something I can't fix, me and him are going to get together and go find the person who can. Everybody needs help. The idea that you don't need help because you got a man is stupid. Now, if this is an ongoing thing and it's always the case and every time you look up, then there needs to be a conversation with the man to find out what's going on because now we're talking about decision making. And that can be a problem. But if you got a man and he's busting his ass and he's trying to do it and he's there, he's putting forth the effort. Don't let nobody break uh, your, your connection with him until you till he has proven to you that he, ha he doesn't have your interests at heart. He's trying to find a way you might be able to, 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 to be a connection or a, a, a sense of light. Sometimes his confidence is hanging on your affirmation. Instead of saying, you're fucking up, maybe you ought to be saying, I know you got it. I believe in you. And, you know, maybe you pick up a phone call and say, hey, look, he's been trying to do this for a while. You think you can help him out? Don't tell him I told you. Okay, that. But here's the problem. Black men have gotten this idea that one of the ways to look good in front of a woman is to point out how horribly her man is doing financially. Oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. And the crazy thing is, because I do so much in this area, I know the truth. Black men are struggling. Not because we're weak. Not because we're lazy. Not because we're ignorant. Not because we're stupid. Because literally, the system is set up to make sure we never become empowered. We are three to four times more creative. We prove that on a regular basis, sometimes the wrong ways, but we are highly creative. Look at the things that we've created. Look at the things we accomplished. When, when you see something exceptionally done, exceptionally well, extraordinary, it's normally a black male, if not a black female. And everything follows that from the traffic light on down. Edison fucked around with that damn light bulb until Latimer says, dude, put this filament in here. You're getting on my damn nerves. I mean, over and over again, we're brilliant. So it's not that, and we work. I get up every damn morning. Nobody wakes me up, no alarm clock. I get up and I'm driven. Even with most of my kids, adults now, and me being unattached, the idea of saying divorced to single doesn't sit well with me, unattached, but it is what it is. 
I still get up. I'm still driven. I still have a purpose. And it's never been anything different to me. Sometimes I'm on my game. Sometimes I'm not. But I'm driving. I'm pushing. There ain't nothing lazy about me. I'm never laying around. Hell, I came home from having five heart attacks the next day in the seat. Came home from having a darn gone seizure that put me in ICU and uh, caused me to fall over, dislocated both of my shoulders, had damage. I still got damage right now. This here, I can't feel none of this. That's from the seizures when I had both my shoulders dislocated. This bone right here broke off, created nerve damage. This finger couldn't move. Guess who I was the first day I came home from the hospital? I was working, trying to figure out. I didn't know how I was going to do it, man. I, I, I type. Oh, I do a lot of typing as a part of what I do for a living. What am I going to do? I figured it out. So last thing I can be called is lazy. I'm not perfect, I don't know it all, I don't always have the right answers, but I always have the right intent and I figure it out. What is it then? Because when I say that, I, I wanna give you some numbers. Does, does your man pay all the bills is a gauge on whether or not he's a real man now. The median income for black men is 44,000 a year. You know how Lean a household budget have to be for a man that makes 44000 a year to pay all the bills. Most black women don't want to live like that. Most black, being, black women ain't trying to live on that budget. So the idea that all black men who are good men are paying all the bills. Now, should he desire to be the provider? Absolutely. Should he have the capacity to be the provider? Absolutely. Should he have a plan on being the provider? Absolutely. Should you be able to see progress in him doing it? Absolutely. But what you have that lasts is because you built it together. Look. I'm going to say this and then I'm done. I'm listening to this kid talk about this hug. And I'm almost at tears because all I could think about was last year. And the thing is, when you're going through this moment, when you're going through this hardship, life ain't sitting around saying, well, you know, this, you know, this is going to, we're going to give him a break here. We're going to give him a break here. All the stuff that you're responsible is still coming. All the clients I had that needed me to be on my A game still showing up. All of this stuff is happening. And you've got to perform. But you need a hug. But you can't say you need a hug because that's some weak shit. You can't say I'm off my game because that's some weak shit. You can't say my heart is broken because that's some real weak bullshit. So you got to walk around and pretend that nothing's wrong. You're internalizing it. And then when you snap and either kill yourself or hurt someone else, everybody's wondering what the hell happened. That's some... We have got to create a space for black men to be human. Am I saying lower the standard? No, I'm saying raise the standard. That's so much more we can do as men, but we need to be whole to do it. That needs to be connectivity to do it. That needs to be community to do it. That has to be a lifeline from the black woman to do it. Black woman, you need a lifeline from the black man. The idea that you can do it without him is setting you up to go through an entire life and do less than what you are capable of doing by some ideology. And stop buying into this propaganda that's force feeding this idea of who we are. They don't show us nothing but the worst of our women and the worst of our men. And we literally buy into that. And I'm telling you, none of the people I hang around act like the people we see on those screens, listening to on that radio. They are good people every day waking up trying to better themselves. I saw something beautiful the other day. Same guy who was there for me, Mark. 
saw a sister who's really busted her ass to pick herself up and reinvent herself, going through a moment and the calmness in which he met her. That's what we need. Because people who have gone through things are normally going to express themselves in a reflection of what it is that they've been through. So when when women are acting a certain way, brother, know that know know that behavior, that anger, that hostility, that volatility is coming from somewhere. They weren't born that way. They've been through something. You didn't do it. It's not your fault. And you shouldn't have to have to take the brunt of it. But you're there now. You've got a choice. You can judge her. You can push her away and leave her to try to figure it out. Or you can take a big risk. And attempt to love her back to life. It's a risk. But it's a risk that I would advise anybody to take. Because at the end of the day, what you give doesn't always come back to you through the vein in which it was given, but it always comes back. We've got to have a force of love in our community that sees the pain instead of judging the behavior, touches the pain with a healing hand with a healing word, with the right energy. But we've got to acknowledge that the presentation of strength is not the elimination of suffering, of pain, of heartache, of disappointment, of frustration. Sitting up pretending that you're good doesn't remove it. Saying I'm good is not a healing mechanism. You got to go through that. You got to go through that. You got to allow yourself time to heal. You got to allow yourself time to grow. You got to allow yourself time to figure it out. You got to answer some questions. We've got to learn to love on each other. We've got to learn uh, to be strong for one another. And black brothers, it's okay to need help. I don't care what they tell you. It's okay to say I'm weak. Everybody has moments of weakness. Trying to be strong 100% of the time, all the time, will guarantee that at some point you're going to break here's the problem with that you don't get to dictate what happens after you break you want to hope that nothing catastrophic happens you want to hope that you can find somewhere to get somewhere to mend it doesn't always happen you don't want to push yourself to the brink when you can find an outlet get professional help yes but i'm telling you that that has to be some 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 love going on between us as brothers where there's no money exchanged that's why i stop and i talk to the homeless people give them a hug and talk to them acknowledge that i see them that they're not invisible, that they do matter. Because feeling like you don't matter, feeling unseen, takes its toll. Like when I like I when I heard David Mann say it's like I'm drowning, but nobody around me knows I'm drowning. And the only way that they're going to ever see I'm drowning is after I've drowned. Like, wow, man, it's me. It's like I'm screaming. I need help. I'm screaming at the top of my voice. I need help. 
but nobody hears me. And nobody will hear me until I go silent. It's too many men going through that. Too many good men going through that. So, brothers, I love you. Hold your head up. It's okay to say you need help. It's okay to reach out. There's so much we go through that people don't understand. Some of us have dealt with issues with, with the mothers of our children, holding our, holding our children and using them as weapons. And, 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 and then the society around us is saying, you're not fighting hard enough, but nobody's asking her why I have to fight in the first place. There are some things that aren't right on both sides. Our sisters are dying. Our sisters are being harmed. None of this is acceptable, but it has to be uh, viewed through a lens of love. We are so beaten and broken that we have become so individualized and ego driven that all we can see is what's going on with us. And when I say ego driven, I'm not talking about ego from the sense of how it's presented. I'm talking about the centering of the self that's so so focused on self-preservation and self-progression uh, uh, that it, it, it has no time and energy to think about or be concerned with anything else but saving self, helping self, pushing self. And so this ego, I'm not talking about the, the grandiose ego, the ego that's got to be stroked. I'm talking about the ego that's afraid, the ego that's concerned, the ego that's been hurt, the ego that's been bruised, the ego that's been denied, the ego that's been stepped on and kicked. And that goes male and female. We've been dealing with that so long. We've got some problems. Man, I'm telling you, we have got to love one another. I talk about so many different things. I've put in so many hours of research. I've done so much with programs. I am so grateful for the life that I've been given. I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had. I'm grateful for the things I've been able to do. I'm grateful for the challenges before me. I'm grateful for the things that I'm going to do in the people's lives. I'm going to change. But I'm telling you, it's not easy. We need to love one another. We need to find a way to hold each other accountable. Hold each other to a higher standard, but love one another. When a brother tells you he's hurting, believe him. When he tells you he's afraid, believe him. When he tells you he's off his game, believe him. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I thank you guys for giving me so much of your time. But I just had to share that. I just had to share that. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys, take care. Yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like it. That just ain't good. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.
to me, whoever I want.